Ja, ähm, hi everybody. Very happy to be here at Freifunk today. Uh, infrastructure is my topic. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's see how that goes. So I'd like to start with two introductory statements. Um, one is not really a theory, but just a sociologist's intuition that mankind has to take social models to the extreme. So fascism was industrial holocaust. We learned the lesson the hard way that Auschwitz should never happen again. Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot were communism extreme. Trump now is taking capitalism to the extreme. His promise was draining the swamp, and the swamp, of course, is the public sector. Taking things to an extreme means the pendulum after that can only swing back uh, and I think we have to prepare for the alternatives that is strengthening the public sector and the commons. On infrastructure, a bit of history. The Wizards of OS were a conference series from 1999 to 2006. And when I invited Richard Stallman, his first question was, does OS stand for open source? And I said, no, no, it's not open source. You can come. I mean, that was his, his idea. If it's open source, I'm not coming. No, no, no problem. It stands for operating systems. And you can see here operating systems of the system society. So the idea was that of a functional distinction between the operating systems and the application layer, uh, where the operating system also includes protocols and standards. And so apps is what people actually use. That's where the cool stuff happens, uh, whereas people expect, I mean, nobody actually uses an operating system for uh, itself, but people just expect it to work reliably and stably in the background. So then the distinction also was taken further to the infrastructure and application layers of society. So then uh, the operating system layer would be money, laws, spectrum, on top of which the interesting stuff happens. Oh, that was an animation. Yeah, there it moves. It moves. So, we know three ways to organize processes in society, including infrastructure, market, state, and commons. Companies don't serve the public welfare, but that of their owners. Yet, there is the stubborn idea that the sum of the activities of all the market participants in the end creates the greatest common good for all. And this is how it goes. Given two companies, they, they will compete. One brings out a new popular product, the other innovates to win back customers. The customers vote with their feet, they decide they are the sovereign. So the idea that these two elements, competition and choice, bring forth products that, ever better, that are ever better suited to consumers' needs. We have rational gain maximizers who only look at their own uh, interests, but through the invisible hand of the market, automatically the common good emerges. This is not true, obviously. Trump aside, the Paradise Papers have recently shown this again. The unbridled market is not interested in social, cultural and democratic concerns. This was the lesson of the 19th century high capitalism, which brought dramatic changes, uh, uh, dramatic misery, and raised the social question for large parts of the population. And that social question was answered by Otto von Bismarck with a public social insurance system. Oops, too fast. Here's Bismarck. No, there we go. Um, the global economic crisis in the 1920s made the misery of urbanization and alienation manifest. So here we have a philosopher, Karl Jaspers, and a law scholar, Ernst Forsthoff, who argued that without the possibility of subsistence, people in urban settings relied on um, receiving these services from the public sector. 
And here you see a list of examples, so gas, water, electricity, sewage disposal, public transport, uh, telecommunications was included as well, healthcare since the end of the 19th century, education, libraries, museums, um, then in the 1960s also public service media were included in that list. Then in 1996, four years after the European Union was founded, um, the European Commission issued a communication on services of general interest in Europe. Uh, services of general interest is Eurospeak for what in France and Switzerland is called Service Public or Daseinsvorsorge in German. And this communication states that many Europeans view general interest services as social rights that make an important contribution to economic and social cohesion. And this is why they are at the very heart of the European model of society. They represent values that define Europe. So very strong statement. Yet at the same time, in parallel and contrary to that movement, we uh, see a, a market radical delegitimization of the public sector. Governments in the 1990s, those are the conservatives, followed up by the Democrats and Social Democrats in the 1990s, presented public administration as wasteful and inefficient and the market as the best and most efficient uh, solution, the best mechanism for matching consumer demand and supply. We're at Freifunk, so telecommunications is an issue here. Let's look at how that movement played out there. The divestiture of AT&T in 1994, of course, was a very important point in time. In Germany, the same movement required a change of the constitution that took place in 1994. Since then, Article 87F reads that um, uh, telecommunication services shall be provided as public, as private economic activities by companies, meaning that a city or a municipality may not provide communication services. Now, it was clear that uh, there is still an obligation um, towards all citizens of providing these services and there was the fear that the market would not provide telecommunication services to the poor or to rural areas which are very expensive to connect. So um, there was this idea of universal service that in a directive in 2002 was expressed stating that the member European member states have to ensure that nationwide adequate and sufficient telecommunication services are available to all. Uh, functional internet access was defined as narrowband uh, access and extending that to broadband access was rejected. And in 2015 uh, the, the German uh, um, telecommunications regulator argued that not even the universal service uh, requirement for uh, telecommunications companies was uh, necessary any longer because the funding programs for municipalities for passive infrastructure and then for uh, the, uh, the the telcos for the active components seem to work and they uh, promised to solve the problems of uh, rural broadband access through the market. That expresses a shift from inclusion of all towards gigabit networks of the future, shift of priority. In 2006, the report to the Club of Rome from the group around Weizsäcker were addressing the problems of privatization and showed the limits of those and here you see the pendulum swings back from private to public. An example of that would be the recommunalization of the Berlin water utilities. But the delegitimization of the public sector continues and I think this is uh, very important for us as well. We have something to lose here. 
Finally, the third approach, the commons approach, which I think is one of the greatest achievements of the digital revolution so far. Networking of virtually everyone on the planet made entirely new forms of open cooperative creation possible, for which Jochai Benkler coined the term commons-based peer production. Here are some more examples. So Benkler um, developed that term using the examples of free software and Wikipedia. So we can say that for essentially every problem we have, we have three kinds of solutions. Let's take search engines. Of course, 95% of the search market is owned by Google. Dirk Lewandowski from the University in Hamburg proposed a public index, openwebindex.eu, if you're interested to look it up. The idea being that the index, which is the most expensive uh, part of, of every search engine, should be considered a public utility on top of which any number of search engines uh, with their specific uh, algorithms uh, can be set up. And um, a peer-to-peer -peer solution would be Yassi, where the index is created on the hard disk of uh, the users of that peer-to-peer -peer search engine. Let's take hate speech. Certainly, if that concerns criminal offenses, that is the task of public law enforcement. It used to be. Recently, we had a law passed in Germany uh, that privatized privatize that responsibility. So now Facebook, Google, etc. have the obligation to delete obviously illegal content within 24 hours, uh, otherwise they will get very high fines. Um, so again, a shift from uh, public responsibility to private responsibility. Now, crowdsourcing m may sound a bit strange. The idea here is not that we all go into Facebook and clean it up, but we know that in principle it's possible because Wikipedia from the very start had to deal with spam and abuse and has developed a very uh, efficient and very uh, stable mechanism of dealing with that. So we can think of uh, common solutions here as well. The problem is that um, the public solution is uh, continue to be delegitimized and the common solutions become invisible. So free software has become normalized and it's uh, for, for developers it's, uh, it's very normal to start a new project with research on existing free software but outside that community uh, it's, it's, it's practically impossible. So Firefox is just another um, free browser in the sense of free beer. Um, Catherine Mayer, the new director of the Wikimedia Foundation in a recent talk, um, said that they found that many people across the planet think that Wikipedia is actually a service of Google. The reason, I think, probably being that when you search something on Google you get the search results which is the list and people understand if you click there you go outside Google but then there's this info box right often you, you get an info box and it has the name Wikipedia in there but the, the, the way it's set up it looks like this is still part of the Google service you get, so Wikipedia is part of Google. We have a problem there because if people don't realize this is an entirely different model, then obviously people are not in a situation to defend it if it's being attacked. Um, the idea is about combinations as well and combining market solutions and state solutions typically is very problematic. So think of public-private partnerships that usually lead to rip-off of the public partner. But there are uh, interesting uh, combinations as well. Wh who is familiar with Stokap? Okay, so 
uh, Sweden was very early with liberalizing the telecommunications market and um, the, the city of uh, Stockholm decided that wait sorry uh, decided that the um, fiber cable network should be a public utility so they set up this company Stokap um, which is a for-profit company but then it's a public company so it's not geared towards profit maximization but of maintaining itself uh, and maintaining obviously the extensive fiber infrastructure that exists there on top of that and then then of course since it's a public infrastructure so uh, it grants um, um, access to providers of uh, active components for internet, uh, telephony or uh, um, uh, television services, for mail, for VPN and what have you. They all sit on top of that infrastructure, um, on that pre-competitive infrastructure uh, that provides the basis for competition, for diversity, for innovation and freedom of choice. Um, let's look at spectrum. For spectrum policies we can see a sort of an original state. It's not really original because uh, in 1912 already there, were re there was regulation in the United States but that was abolished by a court ruling in 1926 so for about the period of one year there was no regulation at all and that meant that radio stations at the west coast would boost the power of their transmitters so they could reach the east coast and th that led to um, uh, wire fences being electrified people would l would listen to radio in the fillings in their teeth which sounds like fun but then if you can't turn it off it's n not so much fun so uh, in the end everybody was boosting up the power everybody was was um, blowing away but nobody could be heard and then the state stepped in and said we have to regulate that and then we get uh, the, the the standard uh, state allocation of frequencies of the state regulators of the FCC in the US and Bundesnetzagentur in Germany already in the 1950s uh, people came up with the idea that this is an allocation problem and that typically can be solved better by the market rather than the state. Uh, that came to fruition in um, 1994. That was the first time that uh, Spectrum was auctioned off as private property. The Commons model here sort of is free licensing. That also goes back to uh, the 1920s. But uh, in our context, most important is the free licensing of the 2.4 gigahertz band uh, in 1985 in, in the US again. So in Germany and other countries, the same processes happen with a bit of delay. Um, and that free licensing of that spectrum did not lead to a commons. It led to baby phones, remote controls, to the first devices for uh, wireless uh, wireless uh, LAN, but th those were not compatible because there were no standards yet. And in uh, leading up to the decision of free licensing the 5 gigahertz band, the FCC uh, asked the community how they should deal with the tragedy of the commons, referring back to that period of chaos and confusion in 1926 and 1927 so overuse of a common resource how can we prevent that um, and then the answer was power limits very minimal regulations uh, and the idea that a self-regulation of the user community would emerge um, and that indeed was uh, standardization by IEEE in 1997 the first um, 802.11 standard was issued um, and this 5 gigahertz band was called 
the unlicensed national information infrastructure by the FCC. So since then, the FCC uses three models. That is the command and control model, that's allocation by state, exclusive use, so auctioning off spectrum uh, to a company that has exclusive use, uh, can allow others on that spectrum, can lease the spectrum, can resell the spectrum. Uh, so th there was even um, a period of secondary markets for reselling spectrum. And the final model is called Spectrum Commons. Now, if you hear the word commons, you have to be careful because there are two commons. The Ostrom Commons and the Hardin Commons. So, if you look back in the 19th century, Karl Marx, Max Weber, they were talking about a commons that was still active in their lifetime. Um, and that was picked up uh, by Eleanor Ostrom, uh, f finding, researching these commons infrastructure uh, across the planet. And the idea here is that commons is not a property attached to a thing. Sometimes you hear the air is a commons. That's nonsensical because in, in that uh, uh, traditional of commons, you understand that it's a social arrangement. It requires a community of commoners who takes care, that takes care of that common resource. Now comes Garrett Hardin, who in famously in, 1990, in 1969 wrote the uh, uh, article on the tragedy of the commons. And here we find a model that lacks a social arrangement. There's, there's a beautiful uh, video where Eleanor Ostrom makes fun of Hardin, saying, ah, that's a scientific paper? No, there's no data there. It's just this thought experiment. And, um, and, and it assumes people who don't talk to each other, right? There's no communication, which doesn't exist in any real existing commons. So she received the Nobel Prize for debunking the Hardin model which isn't, in the end, very difficult because what she did is show that Hardin wasn't talking about the commons at all, but about an open access regime to an unappropriated good. Now, what about spectrum? Unlicensed spectrum grants conditional open access. If you adhere to the conditions of the FCC, you don't have to ask additional permission. But that's not yet a commons because there's no community. But that community emerged around certain uh, processes of standardization. The IEEE is a community of engineers, but also the amateur radio community, the Freifunk community devised their own models of regulation. Jochal Benkler was the first to talk about the commons in a positive way and not in a tragic way. But uh, uh, Benkler still remains stuck in the Hardin uh, Commons model. So um, he, he talks about the, an infrastructure commons. Oh, so this counterintuitive idea that uh, the spectrum is not a thing. It's not a finite resource that needs to be allocated, but we're dealing with a coordination problem. And what he envisions actually is uh, what the FCC did for the 5 gigahertz band, creating an infrastructure commons. And then this is, this is a comparison you find very often with English native speakers, also with Larry Lessig and others, a comparison to from the, the commons to Si public sidewalks, public streets, public parks that are operated as a commons. And that's, that doesn't make sense because public sidewalks, streets, parks are maintained by an office for public parks and so other, other uh, you know, uh, uh, services. So it's a public infrastructure, right? What they focus on is the fact that it's free access for all and you don't have to ask additional permission. 
Bengler is aware that something happens that creates some form of regulation on top of what the FCC does, but he doesn't see a community of commoners what he sees as a market and choice. And that brings forth um, what, what, what he expects. So let's leave theory aside because in practice, the, necess the necessity to uh, self-regulate emerges anyway. And now we go into a bit of a history of uh, free wireless movement. Um, one of the pioneers, I mean Medosh, I'd like to mention specifically uh, because he passed away this year. Um, he was living in London in the late 1990s. Uh, he was involved in setting up Backspace, uh, an internet cafe in Winchester Wharf. Um, James Stevenson and Julian Priest were uh, important uh, figures in that. Um, and they created the Consume Manifesto in 2000. That is already a prototype of this commons community. They were also talking about mesh networking already. Um, then that extends uh, to a global dialogue. Of course, you had initiatives like that in the US as well, in other countries. Uh, and in 2002, a global group issued the Wireless Commons Manifesto. Also in 2002, a meeting took place in Berlin, Berlon, where people from London, from Denmark, from Spain and from Berlin met. Um, and that was, that was sort of a core meeting where uh, the Pico Peering Agreement uh, took its start. That was finalized a year later in uh, Stockholm. Freifunk was started in that meeting. The Berlin Backbone was started. Um, and then in 2003, Elektra came in uh, developing mesh technology. There was a, a first pilot at the Chaos Communication Conference in 2003. Uh, the Freifunk firmware was developed by Sven Olaf Türk in 2004. And then in 2004 also, Armin wrote his book Freie Netze with very rich histories on, on all this uh, that, that I just mentioned very briefly here. In his blog, he was working on a follow-up book, The Rise of Network Commons, now in English and updated, of course, um, but he was not able to finish that. So um, we've started a little project of uh, publishing this book uh, posthumously. Again, it's Tuvat. If anyone is interested in helping us edit this book, uh, please talk to me afterwards. At the Wizards of Oz 3, Armin organized a panel and a workshop with Elektra Zeven from Seabase, Jürgen Neumann, Dwayne Hendricks <coughs> from the US was there, Thomas Krag from Copenhagen. James Stephen, Adam Burns, uh, and so on. Um, the uh, OLSR, the, the, the one of the first large-scale OLSR experiments took place on the Berlin backbone, still with miserable results, but it was the beginning of the development. Um, it was free also. Uh, Wikimedia Germany was founded. Creative Commons met. Uh, and you, you see Armin again. Uh, in a group of lawyers, Thomas Dreyer, uh, Till Jäger in the background, uh, Christiana Aschenfeld, who was legal lead of Creative Commons Germany, and Larry Lessig, of course. Creative Commons is another particular thing, stipulating that it's a commons in the sense that once something is, is licensed under Creative Commons, you don't have to ask additional permissions. So it's, again, free access. But do we have commons communities, actually? Yes, there are a few. For example, CC Mixter, which emerged from a CD on the cover of a Wired magazine, uh, and that led to a community of remixers um, that is still active today. A student of Larry Lessig's uh, sort of helped clear up this confusion by stating that 
there is this rampant confusion about the term commons that says that uh, commons is open to anyone to use, which is, again, not true. And so Stuart Buck suggested a form of co-management starting from localized spectrum management communities. The idea being that the local community knows best uh, the local conditions, the topology, uh, how certain frequencies are used in that area, where there might be uh, collisions that need to be avoided. And then there's a, f a, frame, a minimal framework regulation by FCC and maybe by ITU as well. So Buck starts from Ostrom's eight principles of successful common pool resource management. The first point, there needs to be a clear boundary of users, who is inside the commons, who is outside. Then uh, the general provisions need to be adapted to local rules. There needs to be a way for all involved to participate in decision making. If you have rules, adherence to the rules needs to be monitored. People who don't adhere to the rules, uh, there, there have to be uh, the, uh, there has to be the possibility of sanctions against that. If a community runs up into a situation where the community itself cannot solve the problem, it's good to have external uh, conflict resolution mechanisms, a mediator, by, uh, for example, who comes in um, that is a trusted party to all. Uh, and then finally, if uh, the eighth point, if the commons starts to grow larger, a national commons, for example, an international commons, you get a nested, federated structure, for example. And that's exactly what Buck suggests. So I want to conclude with four projects to come. Um, Ostrom's eight principles of commons management is also informing a project called Net Commons. This is an ongoing uh, Horizon 2020 uh, European funded research project with re researchers from Gifi for, uh, in, in Spain, from Linux in Italy, from Zalantopolo in Greece, and from Freifunk. Um, and they are working on an extensive mac uh, mapping of community networks on the tools that different communities have developed for network management, but also for governance, for ensuring participation of all uh, people involved. Um, they map telecommunications policies and compare them across the EU, the legal frameworks. Um, and if you go to their site, uh, netcommons.eu, under deliverables, you will see a very rich uh, uh, number of uh, papers already, and there is more to come. This project continues into 2018. Um, the building firmware for existing commercial routers obviously is always difficult, so the idea came up of building our own. And that idea was escalated with the router lockdown regulation by FCC in 2015 that was echoed by uh, European regulation of the same kind. So the pressure was really up uh, to, to build something of our own. Then Alta Mundi in Argentina received a grant and took the lead in that project. That has been designed. Electra was, is, is part of that group as well. Um, the first batches of prototypes have been received a few weeks ago um, and there's still uh, continuing development, but uh, they are expecting the final devices to come out in early 2018. And the nice thing about this, these routers will not only work on the 2.4 uh, and 5 gigahertz bands, but also in the TV white space spectrum. This is another project uh, that I'm involved in that is using uh, the TV frequencies. So uh, currently that's DVB-T2. 
that are not used. So in urban areas, all that spectrum is being used, or most of that spectrum is being used. But in the countryside, typically most of those are not used. So we can use that for other purposes, and that is specifically the last mile in rural areas. Um, and with the Libre mesh router, we can, we can take ready-made hardware uh, to build that infrastructure. And that's, of course, connected to the Commons idea. So the idea will be to build local infrastructure in the hands of the local communities. Again, combining models, state and Commons, I think, uh, are two things that are different, but they inherently belong together. Both uh, are striving uh, to serve the common good. And um, this is a project that was triggered by the crisis in public service media, uh, but also by a new strategy by the BBC, who, uh, which has said that they will open up their internet platform for other knowledge institutions in the UK, museums, universities, festivals, and others. That was picked up in, in Germany, where um, three scholars said, we want that in Germany too, but we would also like to include Wikipedia, for example. Um, so we're building on that, extending it. So all these proposals for internet platforms for public service media are nationally focused. We said that doesn't make sense. In the project Europe needs a European public sphere, so let's extend that to Europe. So the title, working title is European Public Open Spaces, and the idea is to bring these together. Status of that is a discussion proposal, but also a draft for a research and development project. So we have a four country, five research group uh, uh, project, and um, yeah, let's see where where this goes. So this is the logo of the EBU, the European Broadcasting Union. This is the logo of Europeana, a network of um, uh, several thousand museums, libraries, and archives across Europe. And that's Wikipedia, of course. Um, thank you for your attention questions, discussions, Tuvat, if you'd like to join any of the projects I've mentioned, you're welcome. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, then thank you again. And add, oh, one question. Uh, sorry for the question. <laughs> um, um, I'm very interested in, in, in the distinction you made between the, um, the, the commons and uh, state-funded, um, for example, public streets and things like that. Uh, because it seems to me that um, there is uh, certainly always a balance between the two and it's a, it's a uh, gradual shift. Um, in the sense that, for example, on a street you would also have um, rules that are not state regulated but are decided by people. So we don't stand in each other's ways, we don't throw uh, litter, we, we don't litter the streets and so on and so forth. So, so is there a clear cut distinction between the two or is it rather, I, I, I would suspect that there is also some, some gray, gray zone between them. What happened? Oh. Oh, I'm ah, ah, wrong side. Okay, um, no, I don't think there there, there is the sort of gray zone or overlap. It is uh, three categorically different ways of running things, and of course, there is a general politeness that we don't stand in each other's ways and litter and stuff. So, um, but the resource, public street, public park, is operated, maintained uh, in a sustainable way by a government office using tax money. There is no commons community that self-organizes, that has meetings to uh, decide on, we have a conflict, what, what are we going to do about this? Um, but that's, of course, I mean, democracy in a sense is also 
a, a, a process of deliberation, of uh, finding answers to conflicts. But you, again, it's you, you would um, sort of destroy the distinction, the categorical dis distinction, if you said that the state is basically a commons. The, this is the this, Max Weber made the distinction, or many sociologists made the distinction between community and state, and I think that's that's a categorical distinction. Again, they they can work together. I think they because um, neither of them is geared towards personal gain, but both are geared. Uh, to Wikipedia bringing the knowledge of the world to everyone and that's basically also what public service media wants to do right so there's there's in in the in the intent there is an overlap so they can work together did, did that sort of clear thank you yes thank you again give him a warm applause